Thinking about going to a networking event anytime soon, we're going to talk about how to make sure it's worthwhile. And if you're also thinking about making a podcast, starting a podcast, let's talk about how to define success. All right, welcome to episode 30 of Insights as a Service. Let's get stuck in. All right, so Nick, uh, you're here as you always are. We've also got Harriet uh, from Your Sales Co. And also more recently, uh, Sell Like You, the new podcast. Uh, yes. Congrats on launching that. Yeah, thank you. Two weeks. Two weeks Two in weeks. the making. Um, we'll yeah. come back to that. Keen to, keen to talk about how you're going to um, you know, define success with the new podcast, uh, the reasons for for doing it, et cetera. But I'll come back to that because we haven't got you for long today. And um, what I wanted to lead with was talking to you with your sales coach hat on about how to make the most out of in-person networking opportunities. And it comes from uh, my recent experience having just got back from Las Vegas, where I found myself in two conferences. Uh, one I hadn't planned to go to. I managed to sneak in. Security was lax. It was great. <laughs> um, didn't have a lanyard. Uh, not a problem. But, uh, you know, you walk into these crowded expo halls, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of people talking that look like they probably know each other, especially if you're flying solo, which um, after my initial um, meeting was over, I was at that particular one. Um, it can be really intimidating knowing where to start and not just wanting to slink away and kind of back off into your own comfort zone. So you and I, when we last caught up, you joined us a number of episodes back, talked about the uh, the ways that you can really maximize value from networking events and just how best to go about in-person meetings now that COVID's somewhat in the rearview mirror. So I guess to start off with, you know, what are the things that you've found people need to overcome in those, in those um, the, the sort of mental blockers people need to overcome when they go into those, those networking environments? Mm. I think when people go into those environments and they're not confident, they go in and they stand on the edges or they go with somebody and they just end up talking together. And Guilty. that's never a good point. And, and I always, you know, I try and go to so many events on my own and I'll say, yeah, cool. I'll see you there, but we're not going together because if I'm going to go together, I'm end up going to end up talking to you. Whereas I find if I go into a room of people that I don't know, what's the worst that could happen is I go over and speak to somebody and they say, oh, hi, yeah, nice to meet you. And then turn their backs to me. And mm -hmm you know, but people aren't going to do that. They're not that rude. And so I think one of the biggest things is just getting over that confidence and knowing what it is that you could actually bring to a conversation. And so I know, I don't know whether this was on our last podcast or whether it's something we just talked about off, offline was about how, when I used to go to events, I used to take pictures of the registration table. It's like my hack. And I used to go in and take, I used to get there early and take pictures and then I'd search them on LinkedIn and then I'd go and find who I want to go and speak to. So I'd be like, where's the name with that name on from that company? And I'd go over and say, hey, I've been following you for a little while or I'm aware of your journey. My name's Harriet. Great to meet you. How's your event going? And you go in and you ask an open question that's got nothing to do with what you sell, what they sell. Keep it general. Keep it about the event. Why are they there? Have they been there before? Somebody asked me the other day, you know, when did I find out the find out about the event and why did I go along and what was I hoping to learn from it? That was a great opening. I've never met him before. We don't have anything in common in terms of business, but it was just a great opening. And from there, it turned out we had a mutual connection. That mutual connection reached out to me and now we're doing more business together. So nice. that just happened from that conversation. And I've kind of thrown a few in there, but it may generally comes down to confidence, finding somebody in a room that you hone in on and you want to go and meet or find someone else that's standing on their own. They probably feel worse than you do and go over and say, hey, are you on your own too? Me too. You know, or this is my first yeah, time yeah. here. Or do you know anybody? Should we go and get a coffee? Whatever that needs to be. But you just need to own your own presence in those events. Mm. And that's yeah. really key. You have definitely done that, eh, Nick? Uh, going into a conference <laughs> together and then basically just being attached at the hip. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard to shake sometimes. Just follow me around. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Great call. No matter how much you try, you can't lose me. Yeah. Um, that hurts. That actually hurts quite a lot. Yeah. You get over it. Yeah, get over I, it. I guess really as well with that, if you do go with somebody, set yourself, go and find one person you've never spoken to before. And, you know, again, I, I go to a lot of networking events because I love networking. And I find, again, I'm very particular as to which ones I go to, but I actually went to a small business networking event 
the other a couple of weeks ago and three of my clients who I've never met before they're all online I caught up with them and they were like oh my god like hello in real life this is great and they were with people that and they all know each other and I said do you know every like you know have you met someone yet you don't know and she said no I said well off you go then and she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you've worked with me. I know you can, you can have a conversation. And I, you know, I challenged them to go off and they went off and they met, I think it was four people by the end of it. You know, nice. it's just doing, once you do one, the next one's easy. And generally you'll find someone mm. else who's on the road and you're like, Hey, come and join us. You know, there's, you, you can build stronger connections doing it that way. One of the, um, that conference I went to, they actually had people just repping the conference brand itself, just going around, uh, engaging people in conversation that looked mateless. But as nice as that is to feel like, oh, hey, I've got a safety net there. It doesn't achieve much, right? Like it's kind of a, pretty mean. Doesn't achieve, yeah. Um, but I think to your point, for me, it's it's about going into these events with a sense of purpose. You you have some idea of the outcome you want to get. Like, um, you know, if, if you've got a certain type of customer that's a good fit, trying to understand who else in that room might fit that sort of demo as well. But mm -hmm. I, something I found, like I'm typically not very good at this, right? So it was quite eye-opening for me going to this last one. Um, where I basically just went up and thought, well, A, I just want to know what these people do. Like, I don't know what all these brands are. There's a whole bunch of MSP related brands that I'd never heard of because different market. Um, surprisingly though, some of them had a very strong awareness of Australia, particularly in some of the brands in that, that space. But, um, by asking, what do you do? And then going, right, are you in the Australian or New Zealand markets? And if not, what stopped me from doing that? And then seeing literally what ways were that we could potentially help that it just led to a conversation that wasn't pitchy but has led to some really interesting sort of outcomes. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think a sense of purpose is definitely a, a key part of it. Yeah. And again, it's having that question. And if you've got something there that you can go out and be like, oh, I've seen your, you know, the name on your t-shirt. I've actually never heard of you before. What, you know, what, what, what is it that you do? And then you've got your follow-up question of, are you familiar with the Australian New Zealand market? What are you doing there? And again, you straight away will start thinking about connections between what it is that they do and what it is that you do or what your other MSPs are doing. And you start forming connections with them. And then you can always bring other people into that conversation. And that just makes a much stronger connection. And it's not looking for, you know, like in that conversation, were you looking to get a sale out of it or were you looking to get a connection? I think connection, like you don't really know it's going to come from the connections. Like another good example, I guess, is, um, I actually found that uh, when the person who had taken me into that environment left, because I think basically he was like, oh, there's seats and free drink here and I'm already at the conference. Why don't you just join me for, you know, 30 minutes with chat? It was great. Um, well, um, Slappy was his name. So he's um, on the podcast soon as well, actually. Um, but when he left and I was looking around the room, I saw uh, Zen Contract, which is owned by Greg Sharp, who is sort of a, a friend of our company's owner. So I was like, oh, that's a, that's a brand I know. Uh, and then, you know, one of his team, Ali, she worked in an MSP uh, in Australia. Previously, I think she was the GM. So we just end up having conversations and people know people and there's opportunities that come out of that. But if you don't go on with an agenda, I find those, you're not, you're not pitchy, you're not salesy, you're just having a chat. Those mm -hmm. outcomes come out as a more organic byproduct. It, it has been my experience. 100%. Stay yeah. curious. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. But again, you're not going in there with an agenda. Your agenda, maybe I want to connect with five people. That might be mm. your agenda. And the agenda then isn't to sell into five people. It's to build a connection and a network and add value to a conversation. And then it's then the follow-up piece. And this then, I guess, comes in next is, you know, have you then connected with them on LinkedIn? Did you send them a message when you got back from your Vegas trip to say, awesome to connect with you at this event look forward to staying connected if you want to find out more about what we do you know there's more information here or happy to jump on a call it, you start then linking them through and then you'll find there's three people your mutual connections mm -hmm. and that they may be another question of how do you know harriet how do you know nick how do you know brendan mm -hmm. it you know that then comes through and again you've now got longevity to continue having conversations with that person that may become a client or may have somebody in in a connection that may also become a you're right though, Nick, you, um, that whole stay curious thing. If you go into these conversations just looking to learn, I think that's an endearing trait. Like I think if you can just kind of, yeah, be open-minded and, and looking to genuinely just find out things, um, people respond well to that. You know, you should always have an exit strategy. <laughs> regardless. Even like, even like regardless. in marriage? Like, like it's, it's, at what point does that not, no longer apply? In, 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 in life, I think, <laughs> in, in general, in life, you should always have an exit strategy. <laughs> My God. <laughs> <laughs> But you did touch on something that's very real though, is that first person chat and then them being like a stage five clinger, like, you know, okay, great. We've had a chat, you know, good, good takeouts all good, but now there's other people here to talk to, but then you can't shake them 
that's uh, that's a real problem. Yeah, and, and at that point, you know, look to bring other people into that group as well because you can surround them with other people, and there might be someone who aligns a bit better, or they get bored of you, so you can go and have a chat or or spin off your own sub subgroups. But yeah, I think there's nothing worse than going to those events and being the first person there. But unless you're Harriet and you want to take photos of absolutely everything and all the name tags and get that research time, but yeah, if you can arrive, you know, kind of early, late. but not too early, uh, right. not three hours late. Uh, everyone will be desecrated and you probably miss the presentation, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, I, I think that that helps. And then you, you can kind of walk in, you can, you can kind of go what looks like an exciting group that you might relate to. And then you can actually go and mix and mingle with them. And then you just kind of walk in with a bit, bit more energy into it rather than trying to have to force some conversation and feel a bit strained the whole night. Yeah. Just something you touched on Harriet before you said you don't go to all the events. What does make a good event for you? Like how do you determine which ones you attend? Uh, generally it's trial and error or recommendations because you could spend your whole life in a networking event and I'm sure you feel the same way at the moment. Like there are just, you know, as ever every day, they are morning, lunchtime, evening, and it's about, fi it's, it's finding one. So I, I, my personal opinion, I find that the, um, that the structured ones that are every week, like your BX and your BNIs and all of that. Mm they're very structured and people are trying to sell to each other all the time. And you're constantly having to bring things forward. Whereas an organic networking event that is still a networking event, but there isn't too much structure to it. Mm -hmm. I find I prefer because I can go in and work that room and have better conversations. Whereas there's, I've been somewhere it's, you've got 30 seconds to pitch and then you have to do a quick round and you have to choose three people you want to chat to. And I'm like, am I doing that based on if I think they look nice? Mm. Or am I doing it based on, have they got something to, to bring, you know, can I learn something from them or can they learn something from me? And I feel like that's easier done in a more relaxed environment. And again, I choose mm. them based on industry focus. So again, if you're looking at small business, you tend to find small business, everyone's out there trying to pitch and trying to find their, trying to find their own clients. Whereas I would network, there's a second Thursday of the month. Um, I think they're all over Australia now, um, but different days of the month. And they do those and they're sponsored by a vendor. And I would go along and you would generally find you got a higher caliber of connections there. And so, for example, I would never miss that. Like that was in my calendar. It was one, It was once a month and I just never missed it. So it's really just kind of finding who I can connect with. And that doesn't, success doesn't necessarily mean I got a client out of it. Success meant that I connected with a relevant person. It meant that I learned something or that I could pass on some wisdom to somebody else. And that's kind of generally how I, how I will pick and choose my networking. Smart. Yeah, that's but, it. It's not, I think there's a couple of things there. One is it's, you can't go into these things feeling bad about trying to rep your brand or, and you've got to be uh, in a space where you're comfortable for people to at least tell you what they do. Like you can't, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think particularly in tech, a lot of the time sales can be a dirty word. People just sort of um, pull back from it. There's a lot of introverts. And I think that you kind of got to get yeah. over that to make the most of them. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But the other thing is you're right. You don't have to sell to get value from these things. You can learn. And there's a, especially with the, the MSP related, um, conference i found myself in the expo hall there were so many great brands there doing really interesting things and came away with a lot of awareness market awareness i, I wouldn't otherwise have had yeah and you get to then share that content so again you know talk about the follow-up that's so important and i actually got asked this question on a call the other day and they said that you know i've got people that say to me i'm interested in something that it is that they're doing but then i don't want to follow up because i don't want to seem salesy and that's exactly what you should be doing because they've met you, they've learned from you, they've met you in a great environment, they've told you they're interested, now what are you doing? Like you're just leaving them to either feel awkward and reach out again because maybe we don't want to work with them. And you know, you've got an opportunity there to connect. So I always recommend having that follow-up strategy. But again, if you learn something or say if you meet somebody and they impart some of their wisdom, you can then share that as a learning to your audience. So then it's a case that I went to this event this is who I met. This is what I learned. You know, if you want to come along, I'm going to the next one. Would absolutely love to meet you. So again, you can do that pre-event or post-event. If you're going to something regularly, share the wins from that regular attendance, but also share the fact that you're going next week. And if anybody's in the area and wants to go, then reach out or drop me a comment and make sure we look out for each other. So you've kind of got that pre-work, you've got the post-work and it all ties into something else, but don't just go meet someone and do nothing with it. Otherwise, don't bother. I mean, it might be a free beer. You know, Nick, you might want to go for the free beer. But <laughs> Nick, you've painted a picture here. <laughs> I have. I have. 
No, and the other thing is, I think you know, you get a structure you, either your day after or, or the day before. If you're traveling to a to an event or to a conference and things like that, you want to make the most of your time in that city, right? So, you know, if you are you're doing what Harriet said there, and, and you're kind of letting people know you're in the area, so you look to book a couple of meetings before you know get those kind of vocals warmed up and, and have some good chats beforehand because you might get an understanding of that market and what's going on in that city and then go into the event kind of preloaded with with some you know, relative talking points to, to someone else there or yeah i think it's just a a good strategy from my point of view i uh the other conference i was at was the um zscaler zenith uh live and i had a couple of non-negotiables right there were some people i wanted to catch up with and I felt sorry for them because I basically just stalked the living hell out of them, just would not let up until I actually definitely <laughs> had them caught up. Uh, or ha you know, had a meeting with them on the sidelines. So, um, yeah, forward if you're listening, sorry. Uh, but uh, also thanks uh, for the catch up. <laughs> hey, um, all right, well, let's leave uh, networking events there. I'm keen to talk about this uh, podcast that you've launched, Harriet. Um, so, so like you, everyone go find it, uh, Spotify, everywhere else, etc. cetera. Um, how are you going to define success with that? Because this is something I've struggled with, right? Is um, the attribution. How do you know whether the time that you put in, and I know your other half is a sound engineer, lucky you, that makes life a bit easier. Uh, but uh, but even with that, it is a time intensive exercise to, to run a podcast. So mm -hmm. so how, how are you going to determine or define success from, from your, your podcast launch? Yeah, great, great question. Um, when I got asked about this at the beginning, I actually worked with a podcast coached for the launch of it so I want to know I'm very theory driven so I want to understand all the theory behind it and then I'm happy to go ahead and do the work and you know one of the things she talked about was around the fact of that consistency and I, I understand consistency you have to have consistency in sales and you know she talked about defining success she said like you know what's your goal for this podcast and I said I actually don't you know the chart just a bit like you know for, for me one of the things I didn't want is the charts is not a, a thing for me it's not something that I I'm driven to get into. And I take that really from how I search podcasts and I will search sales because um, I love to listen to other people talk about sales. And I might listen, for example, today I had to drive to a meeting and I searched um, LinkedIn sales. I was like, I'm interested to see what other people are doing on LinkedIn. So that's how I search. And if I actually go and look at business and the charts, it's very few podcasts that I'm actually interested in in the charts. So mm -hmm. That was where my theory came from of not being in the charts. For me, I have a goal to hit a million listeners. That's the goal for the podcast. Now, that's not going to determine whether it's successful or not. Um, but I think then for me is looking at who's listening to it. And I want to have the podcast as another resource to be able to share content, tips, tools, advice, experience, and also leverage my network. Again, we, you know, we're talking about networking, but my network has grown over the years through the UK and through into Australia. And I've worked with a lot of clients all around the world. And so I want to leverage my platform and share that with others because I've been, you know, I've been extremely fortunate to link with some incredible business owners, incredible humans, incredible operators. And I want to bring that to light because again, we hear the same people time and time and time again on podcasts, but I want different people. I want to tell a real story of real people in real business that are maybe not those you know, those ones that write a book, but maybe they're doing something that nobody's ever heard of. And, you know, let's showcase that. So I think really to answer your question around success is just around getting the right people on, being able to share that message and getting that message resonating. And and right now, I guess I'd probably see that in being people connecting with me once they've listened to a podcast, sending me a message to say, I've listened to your podcast and it really resonated and supporting people. Mm -hmm. I think that for me is really where I'm going to say success is going to lie. I think now for the next maybe six months and then that may change. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's difficult with, with podcasts because I think that's, that's a huge part of it is that less tangible, less clear, difficult to attribute, attribute, uh, where you've got people who do reach out people at events that you, re you meet and they go, Hey, I was listening to this or, um, yeah. someone, you know, uh, does send you a message on LinkedIn about the podcast, whatever, but those things matter, but they don't capture everything, of course, because not everyone reaches out who holds, sees value in what you do. Um, we're trying to capture in uh, Salesforce, you know, when people get in touch, how they first heard about us, uh, as well as kind of the more tangible, clear attribution. But even that's not particularly easy because I don't know, people will often say Google, basically, even though the first time they heard about you wasn't via Google, that's just what they searched or used to find you. But tick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it can extracted be tough. out of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
Oh, yeah. that's good. So, so what's been the experience so far? What, you're what, four, two, two or three weeks in, four episodes in? Two weeks. Yeah, yeah, two weeks into the process, yeah. Because you banked like three, I think, before you launched, right? Or a couple? I did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, three. Yeah, you, you've been watching, Brendan. I, I was listening <laughs> yesterday, uh, doing my homework. Uh, let's be prepared. So did you, um, have you got like a set cadence? Are you doing weekly or fortnightly or what are you doing? Weekly. Yeah, okay. weekly on a Monday. So launches at 4 a.m. Australian Western Standard Time on a Monday. Okay. Um, apparently that's the optimum time. So that's what time it's going. Cool. And You're listening, Romain? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah I'm done time. <laughs> nice. Um, so yes, that's that's going through there, and then it's really is. I mean, again, as you mentioned, Brent, it, you're not wrong. It's a lot of work, hmm. and you know, I think I don't think I quite realise how much work has to go into it because, again, you kind of don't just want to do it half assed You want to do it for a reason. And, Wait, and so you that's you don't want you don't want I to don't do half assed Okay, want to do it half right. Again, don't. remain. Yeah, nice. don't, I don't have that. I, <laughs> um, and again, I think it comes back, you know, because because I I do a lot, you know, I share a lot of content through LinkedIn and also across social media platforms such as Instagram, and I have to every now and again just stop and really and ask myself a question, which is, what do I want my audience to get from this? Mm. And I'm doing that with every single podcast because I've got a mixture of guests and solo. And, you know, solo, I mean, I've got, I think I've got a hundred topics already, not recorded just to be very clear, but, yeah. you know, ready to go. And so I'm doing kind of two or three of those because I find when I'm in the groove, I can just, you know, get a few out and then I've got them there. So if I do end up having a, you know, a guest that cancels or I can't record for a week, I've always got them ready and, yeah. and prepared for that. So I find that with, you know, with that piece, I'm always thinking about what, you know, if, if someone listening could learn one thing from this episode, what do I want that to be? And I link that in. I do a lot of research behind the scenes of like what's being searched on Google and, you know, what's the top searches through across LinkedIn and what's the most asked question when I do a discovery call with somebody, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I'm making sure I'm answering those first and then I'm going through then and adding in value and extra, um, I guess, really like another opinion through my guests. And it's really just trying to look strategically as to what that format needs to look like. And then it's then going through then the auditing and then the other process then is that whole uh, advertising piece and, you know, the tiles and then the wave where it has the imaging of the sound and all of that. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I have a team now that does that. So that's, you know, that's generally outsourced. So it's just up to me really just to write the show notes and, you know, create, create the episode, write the show notes, and then that goes off then to a copywriter to update. And then everything else then gets scheduled. So it's, I've kind of defined the process of what success looks like on a day to day. And then now I can outsource that part. Cool. To, um, I oh, sorry, Nick, you want to say? No, it's because I love it. And, and I listened to, um, one, I think it's your first one uh, on sales strategy there. And it was just good, good reinforcement to some of the stuff we covered off during, during our sessions earlier. And, you know, I think as you grow and, and do more episodes there, there'll just be continuous content just to come back, lean on, have a quick refresher. And yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you, Nick. So I think that the thing I found sort of almost unintended consequences is that we post a, a few short form sort of snippets of each episode on LinkedIn. And it seems like there's quite a few people that actually don't listen to the episodes in full, but they consume the short form content and that's just the way they like to take it. So, you know, three minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, um, a few times a week. And that's that's their experience with, with the podcast. Um, and the other one is just the definitely unintended uh, consequence, but a fantastic one is um, yeah, I think you've got a very extensive network. So you're probably reaching out to a lot of people you already know. We've reached out to a lot of people we've never met before, but have very interesting takes on, you know, maybe, maybe business valuation or how to go about mergers and acquisitions or whatever it might be. And that's our first interaction with these people. And then they introduce us to others. And then it just spawns this whole, um, you know, I guess, uh, new market awareness for us, who's out there doing what, new ways of learning, um, introduce, uh, introductions into to new opportunities that wouldn't have otherwise been there. So that's been really kind of eye-opening and, and pleasant to, to have happen. Yeah, mm. and that's a great way, you know, that is a great way to build your awareness. And the same thing as well is even if you're, you know, for you running a podcast, getting on other people's podcasts as well, it will then you then get, on, you know, across their audience and into their ears. Mm. So you're that welcome. you can then share that message wider. Put them. I said, you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I believe that's like very meta is exactly what we're doing right now. So that's good. That works. Yeah. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. I forgot. I shouldn't have highlighted that. That's <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, all good. We, uh, we dragged you on here at short notice. So, so no, all yeah. good. Hey, um, because I know we are short on time. Um, Nick, you wanted to talk about uh, the Dutch parliament, which is a passion of yours. You, you love talking all things Dutch parliament. Uh, do you want to jump into that? 
<laughs> only i think because we're, we're we're led there by lars um no but they they've made work from home a, a legal right uh it still needs to go through through their senate but um essentially what, what it's doing is the law enforces employers to consider whether someone can work from home um as part of their role um and it gives that that employee their right and they're the they're the first I guess, nation to go down that track of making it a, a, a legal obligation so you know that's going to be pretty interesting i think and i wonder if if many others will follow suit the, it'll be interesting to see if a precedent set like what is reasonable um you know what what sort of uh consideration has to be given for it to be considered reasonable by the court somebody will challenge mm. it somebody will say not nah, come into the office somebody will challenge it the court will make a decision and then that'll be the benchmark but you know for me i was thinking about this and and, and back when, when heather started her small businesses like we couldn't have people work from home all the time like you we wouldn't have built the culture we wouldn't have got that that institutional knowledge passed across but you'd legally have to consider whether they could mm. and they probably could so if they could do you have to or do you just have to consider if you brought These someone on tomorrow we'll harriet what would you what would your take be they have to work alongside you for x period of time and then do what they want or no complete remote a majority of people that i work that work with me are remote so they're okay. all over because it depends on where they are and their expertise and mm. mm. um, it's interesting i i work with a, a client in the uk and during covid obviously they no you know nobody was going to the office and they saw their their sales effort dip because they weren't in you know and, and i'm talking about a large sales force that have got i think they had 15 at the time and so they had 15 salespeople and they would buzz off each other and yes they'd be in and out of the office and people would come in and having meetings but because you know they didn't have people there and the person next to them wasn't on the phone they found that they lost momentum and so mm. what happened then is their sales numbers dip now that hasn't happened across the board i've seen you know a lot especially tech companies in australia during covid thrive because they've had the flexibility of being at home and being in the office, you know, versus being in the office. But I think it depends on the person. I think it depends on what you want from them. And, you know, yeah. it, it can be great to be able to grab on, you know, jump on a call, you know, grab them for a minute and then let them get on with it. But I think there is something to be said, same thing with in-person training. There's a lot, you know, you can get a different outtake from that. And I find like having a blend. So having the option to work from home, I think is really important but it's understanding the person and whether that will benefit them, their lifestyle and the way that they work so that you get the most out of them and you, you support them and nurture them in the right way. Yeah. What do you uh, think, Brendan? Sorry. What do you think? Uh, what do I think? I think uh, very similar um, horses for courses. If people want to uh, work from home, you know, you, you, you wouldn't be employing people if they weren't trustworthy. So there's no trust issue there. Um, it's just a matter of making sure they've got the right tools and the right space. Some people, uh, you know, still flatting when they kick off at work and maybe they haven't got the, the nice space to work from for them. You need to provide a space, but, um, no, our experience has been people can work from anywhere, just set a clear definition of success. As long as everyone understands what they're working towards and what is a, um, a pass and what isn't then, then you're good. Yeah. 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 I agree. Cool. Um, the interesting though, I just did uh, some quick, uh, research, um, because I knew you'd want me to Nick, uh, all things Dutch parliament, but. They um, have the I appreciate that. The, <laughs> well, good. Anytime. Uh, they have the lowest uh, average short, uh, sorry, uh, shortest average working week in the OECD with twenty nine point five hours per week. Uh, so there you go. Great place to work. Um, and Part time job for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what Lars, our marketing <laughs> guy, one of our marketing team is uh, doing over here. He could be working ten hours less a week if he was back home. Uh, but um, he, uh, they also um, had Dell apparently a trial of four day working week with their staff. Uh, over there as well so they're, they're kind of like a testing bed for um you know, industrial relations legislation and sort of uh, forward thinking options which is interesting um i don't think we, i don't think we're going to see a tesla or any elon musk uh, based organizations uh, spinning up over there anytime soon no no kind of the exact opposite of uh what he's up for yeah. um last thing uh we'll touch on before we call it a day for episode 30 episode 30 by the way touched on uh we touched on 30 wow um on consistency before harriet uh the weekly uh requirement so yeah 30 30 weeks of a podcast a week uh for us which is wow, uh congratulations hey look thanks it's a weird thanks. number to celebrate but apparently the average podcast lasts like seven episodes so it's uh significantly wow. better than that so yeah yes anywho um uh nz tech article uh was shared or a, a nz tech article was shared by friends at the ancillary earlier in the week about how what is it kmart the good guys and bunnings have deployed facial recognition software here in australia 
uh, to track people. And um, just in a sign of how mainstream that's getting at the casino is at, um, again, in the trip I've just come back from, a guy was telling me that apparently there's facial recognition software on all the machines so that if you win and you don't look sufficiently surprised or happy or elated, that it's a sign of potential cheating. So they they hone in on that. So just, it's amazing to me how how mainstream in almost a covert way this this facial recognition and AI is becoming. Uh, you guys got any concerns about your your face being captured as you walk in and uh, being stored away somewhere? <laughs> Only that they that they store that safely. But you know, I, I think people have been recording people on CCTV for for years. But I guess it's, it's taking it to that next level, right? It's that individually pinning people and being able to track them across multiple stores and habits and stuff like that. And, you know, that may breach your, your privacy to a certain extent, but yeah. you know, it's where the future's going. I don't think there's any avoiding it. It's, it's a, embrace it and make sure that any kind of privacy laws keep up with the technology. And Harry will just have to stop doing uh, whatever it is she's currently doing in Bunnings, uh, Kmart, and uh, the other place just to... to... <laughs> You'll see how excited I am when I find the perfect cushion. <laughs> Start. <laughs> right. Uh, no, but it is... Um, I don't know. I don't think we made a lot of noise about that, but um, it's, a, it's a good example of where maybe legislation's not keeping up with tech, right? There's there's no clear rules around mm. how that has to be um, handled, uh, communicated to customers, etc. So kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, it could probably, you know, easily extend into other things. You know, Tesla's had that sentry mode. If you walk up to them and they record you, you know, does that also do facial recognition? You know, the application for it is endless. Uh, you know, you can imagine who, who scratched my car. It was that guy uh, straight to the police and they come knock on your door. But, you know, if it's not kept in check, um, you know, it could be abused. Yeah. Is it um, overcome by wearing a hat and a hoodie? And a COVID mask and glasses. That too. Just asking for a friend. Just eyes. <laughs> yeah. But I'd probably still capture you on that, actually. <laughs> Apparently, in fact, I heard another story once. Uh, probably all of these stories are a lie. But I, I, uh, there was some um, tech in China, I believe, where even the the way in which you walk was used as a way to identify, the, almost your, your gait uh, was used as a way of identifying one person from another where there was some level of obstruction um, around the face. I. I did hear that that they did use that and they identified someone who jaywalked and then using their like WePay, they just got this like basically charge taken off their account or something like that. And it already fined them taking the money because they jaywalked and the AI had just kind of done it all and all fully automated the whole collection processing, yeah, judge, jury and, and everything. So um, slide aside, but technology for the I one. am relatively law abiding, but um, I have had a tick of a jaywalking. It's one of the one things I've had, which is like, it seems like it's not even a thing, but it's a thing. Service Paradise Police mm. about 16 years ago told me not to cross the road, across the road, go take it. So yeah, there you go. Um, you rebel. Yeah, I am. Badass. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, the worst. All right, cool. All right, well, uh, let's let's leave it there. Uh, Harriet, thank you very much for joining us at Short Notice. Nick, always a pleasure. Uh, I will catch both of you in some form again soon. Thanks for having me. Cheers. See you later. <laughs>